not now, nor have I ever been a believer in the concept that Evgeny Malkin can change on or off the ice. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of Penguins. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or baseball. I also offer daily shots of the other two teams in town that I cover as well, those being the daily shots of Steelers and Pirates. I reported, ooh, when was this? This was a few weeks ago in our Friday Insider feature on DK Pittsburgh Sports that the Penguins had at least broached the subject internally of Geno moving from center to the wing in the coming season. I have no earthly idea how far that got, how seriously it was taken, and whether or not it still exists. But I reported what I knew and just left it sitting there. Well, chances are really good it deserves to just sit there. And here's why. In the Mike Sullivan system, barring any changes to the system, and I think that's going to be the most outlandish thing we could possibly bring up today, the forecheck is everything, and within that, the speed of the wingers to get to the puck for the forecheck is really everything. In the Sullivan dream world, every winger is Drew O'Connor. Every winger is able to get it deep, go get it back, and then make an intelligent play once you get it. That's the DOC way. That's the Sullivan way. And even if you believed that Gino can still rev it up at times, still look like, not necessarily the fastest guy on the rink, but he can have a really strong, authoritative appearance with his leg work. If you're following me on that, it's different than straight out speed. It's churning into the ice. It's moving with a a purpose. You're not going to get slowed down. You're not going to get bumped off. Even if you felt that Gino in his late 30s could do that, he's not going to want to. And I don't mean that in some sort of defiant way. I don't mean that he's going to be a rebel or think he's above that sort of thing. It's just that he's never done it. You'd be asking him to do something that he's never done. Gino is the classic late arrival into the zone center. And he has been that since childhood. He has always been at his best whenever he's the trailer. Dan Bilesma recognized that very, very early in Gino's career and put guys on his wing who were in the Ruslan Fedotenko mold who could just go in a straight line, make some mayhem, get the puck, get it to 71, make magic happen. This episode is brought to you by Bet Online, your number one source for all your summer sports needs this season, from Major League Baseball, golf, NHL, NBA playoffs. Get the latest odds and lines, including all team matchups, player props, odds on just about everything that's out there. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. I also don't believe that there's some... I don't know, some bonus epilogue chapter to Gino's career where he just morphs into uh, the Sergei Fedorov phase where you just become a tremendous defensive force, really, the way Fedorov did, just dominated the rink defensively well past the time when he was into triple-digit points. Gino can be, and by the way, was over the final month a lot better defensively. But here again, you're not going to do something different. Now, everything that I'm saying here would appear to imply that what you're getting from Gino isn't good enough. And I realize and respect that that's an easy argument to make when you compare him to, you know, old Gino as opposed to old Gino. But here's something interesting. He's in his late 30s. He's getting... $5 $5 million, which is still, even at his age, for his point production, is a bargain rate. And this past season, he appeared in all 82 games and put up 27 goals 
40 assists for 67 points. Those 67 points ranked him 30th among all of the NHL's centers. And when you factor in, and I think it's fair to do this, that he's the Penguins' number two center and that he was still in the top 30 at that position, and Sidney Crosby, by the way, was sixth among centers, then the Penguins still had two guys in the top 30 out of a field, simple math here, of 64 total centers being on their team's top two lines. You know, 32 times two. So you're doing okay. And my feeling heading into Gino's final couple of years of his contract is that if he continues to perform and produce at a high level for a number two center, then you're doing really well from a cap management and every other standpoint. If you're the Penguins, set aside all the sentimentality, set aside that you got to really look hard at everything related to this power play, including Gino's role. But just, just look at what he gets you as a number two center for five million bucks. And it, it's pretty good. You don't have to change him. When we come back, J1Q. Today's J1Q comes from Brian, who asks, DK, I honestly think Matthew Grizzly will be a good partner with Chris Letang. What about you? I, I'd like to, first off, Brian, get a you know good look at Grizzly when he's wearing this black and gold as opposed to that black and gold. The reason I say that is you just look at guys differently, even if you feel like you know them, even if you feel like you're familiar with them, they could be inside the division. You see them half a dozen times a year. It's still so different when they come onto the team that you're watching on a regular basis, that you're around on a regular basis. I've always liked Grizzlick's game from afar. It's not anything flashy, but he gets the job done in the defensive zone, and he moves the puck up to the forwards. In that sense alone, that latter sense, he has been a pretty significant contributor to the Bruins' success over the past couple of years. And remember, in the regular season, they are, yeah, they're like regular season champs, like all-time regular season champs. And I'll elaborate as to why I agree with your stance that they might be a nice fit. And principally, it's that Grizzly could be, for Latang what the peak Brian Dumoulin was for Latang, someone who takes care of business, who's responsible, who's not overthinking or overreaching at the position. He's obviously a lefty. He's obviously really smart. And I say that that's obvious from watching him from afar, but he also interviewed really well with the Pittsburgh media the other day. And as such, he strikes me as the type who'd communicate. Latang has always valued that with his partners. He loves to talk about the game. And when I say the game, I don't just mean the sport. I mean that game. Latang is talk, talk, talking all the time on the ice, on the bench, in the locker room, of course, between periods. So, yeah, I'm good with that. And you bringing this up has me looking toward all of the potential pairings, I'm going to presume that you have Eric Carlson with Marcus Pedersen. That one's a no-brainer in my eyes. And from there, that'd leave Jack St. Ivany. And it, it still feels a little bit unfair to pressure that kid and say, oh, yeah, he's got that spot locked up. I think he has to have a good camp to make sure that he keeps that. But I see... Uh, that kid as having at least a, a penciled-in position on the number three pairing. And then uh, I'm not going to get into Ryan Graves again, but Graves is making so much money. And you're bringing in David Quinn in part so that he can work with 
Graves and other defensemen on shoring up their own defensive work. And I think you have to at least start off with the premise that Graves should be part of your top six. If he isn't, there are now uh, actually quite a few options. Most of them of the fringy variety, but sometimes quantity can be as good as quality. I appreciate the question. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Penguins. We're going to do another one of these on Monday. Monday.